So we're here to speak mainly about your new book, Regenesis, uh, which is subtitled Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. And yeah, I find it quite stressful reading this book because you take issue with everybody, including those who think they're, they're putting in place the right solutions, such as uh, the organic lobby or the, the no-dig lobby in terms of, of making our farming and our agriculture greener. Um, and so I wanted to know whether you set off with that premise from the outset or it was something you discovered as you went along. I, I, I didn't really. I mean, I, I was um, very much open to persuasion on every issue because I think that of almost all subjects, food and farming is subject to magical thinking, to wish fulfillment, um, to mythology. Um, um, it, it's And given that this is such a crucial issue and that the predicament I explore this um that how to feed the world without devouring the planet is is possibly the greatest predicament we face it's absolutely essential that we get the facts right and unfortunately you know the more I explored the subject the clearer it became that we simply have got almost everything wrong almost everyone who's who's been involved in this subject is wrong about something um and doubtless that includes myself <laughs> um but 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 for you know the great majority of us are wrong about almost everything on this subject and and we can't afford to mess about with it we have to get it right we can't allow myths to dominate our thinking I mean, the conclusion that you you come to, if I, I say it very succinctly, is basically that we need to stop eating uh, any kind of animal protein, so meat, uh, dairy. Um, but even in the minds of many environmentalists, um, they find this very radical. And most people's solution is simply we'll have a little bit, we'll have less meat, uh, we'll eat a bit of protein, you know, we'll have one day that's vegetarian um, and everything will be OK. Um, but you go way beyond that. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that gone down with environmentalists and, and, and green lobbyists rather than the farm lobby who are obviously not necessarily in favour of going in that direction? Well, it, it's very mixed. Um, I mean, some environmentalists um, really understand the argument, strongly understand it. Interestingly, there's more um, concern about this, I find, among environmentalists than there is among animal rights lobbyists. and and. Some animal rights lobbyists are beginning to take an interest in the environmental consequences of livestock farming, uh, but often it's really hard to to, to cross that divide. Um, But there's also within environmentalism, there is a strand of thinking which I think has been left behind by the science, which is that, well, you know, these... um, um, cattle and sheep grazing in in lovely flowering pastures. Surely that's what we need to preserve. Um, and and unfortunately, while it looks nice, it it simply doesn't stack up. As soon as you start looking at the numbers, you, you've you, the, the 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 case for um, livestock falls apart. But particularly the case for the kind of livestock production that many environmentalists favour, which is organic pasture fed meat production, particularly beef and lamb, which is arguably the worst possible of all agricultural products, worse even than non-organic pasture fed uh, beef and lamb, and much, much worse than the horrible production of chicken and pork in huge factories, which we all hate so much and, and rightly. But in environmental terms, the worst food you can eat that is produced by farming is is pasture fed organic meat and i mean to say that i find it quite shocking and and i know um i recently um interviewed the ceo of impossible foods which makes plant-based burgers and you mentioned them in your book um and i posted the story i wrote on facebook and i have a friend who's an organic farmer in wales who was absolutely horrified by the idea that suddenly we're taking away something which, as you say, seems idyllic, which seems very nice, both culturally, aesthetically, and, and in terms of our food production, um, to what seems to be an industrialization of our food. Um, and, and how um, do you reconcile these? Because in, in other books, you've mentioned very clearly, you know, what's gone wrong with the world and, and corporate interests and, mm. and an over-reliance on technology and industrialization is part of perhaps what's gone wrong. So how do you reconcile this, this need for technology and 
industrialization to a certain extent uh, with the need to to reconnect with nature. Well, none of these things are easy to reconcile. There's payoffs everywhere and and there's no um, pure and perfect solution at all. Um, but um, the first thing to say is, you know, we have to get away from means of food production, which require a massive environmental cost. And, and pasture-fed meat comes top of those simply because of the land area it occupies. It requires so much land. And that means a huge ecological opportunity cost because all that land could otherwise be supporting forests and wetlands and other rich ecosystems. Um, pasture um, covers 28% of the world's area. That's more than twice as much as all the crops on earth. And yet animals um, which survive purely on grazing produce only 1% of our protein. This is a phenomenally profligate means of producing food, and it's just not environmentally affordable. And the only reason why there seems to be plenty of pasture-fed steak and pasture-fed lamb around is that we are using so much land to produce it. It's amazingly inefficient. Um, so the alternative is not, I believe, to go down the route of, of factory animal farming, um, even though that's much more efficient in terms of land use um, and has lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are also huge problems involved with that, um, particularly the concentration of livestock in river catchments, which uh, simply can't absorb the amount of nutrients that they produce in their dung. And everywhere we see um, the factory farming of livestock, we see dead rivers. Um, and then at the other end of the chain, we see the, uh, a massive production of grain to, to feed those livestock. We now see roughly half the world's calories grown by farmers going into the mouths of livestock, which is a tremendously inefficient way of, of using grain. And of course, a huge amount of fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, other damaging practices associated with, with growing that grain. So that's not an answer either. But we need protein and we need fat. Um, as well as the carbohydrates that, that we get directly from grains. So how do we best produce those? Well, I feel that sort of like the cavalry, just in the nick of time, the, 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 the necessary technology has, has come along, which is um, um, precision fermentation, growing microbes in vats, the same way as we grow them when we're making beer or, or producing baker's yeast, for example, um, and, um, and using them directly to produce protein and fat. And it's massively more efficient in terms of land, in terms of water, in terms of nutrients. Every single environmental measure you can imagine is greatly reduced by producing our food that way. But you're absolutely right to point out that there's a real danger that it could fall into the hands of a few large corporations and become highly concentrated in those hands. And already in the food sector, we see a very small number of companies uh, mopping up a very large part of global food trade, particularly in grains and meats. So it's already a huge problem. We don't want to see that replicated in the new food technologies. It's really important we avoid that. So what I my call to other people concerned about this is to say, you know, don't, don't attack the technology, but attack the means by which it can be concentrated. Um, let's get in there at the beginning, because we are more or less at the beginning, and ensure that this becomes a distributed and socially just technology rather than one which is captured by a few huge corporations. And for that, what we need are weak patents and strong antitrust laws. And I think that combination is a pretty good formula for, for all business right across the board. You know, patents, should, intellectual property should be weak. Antitrust laws should be strong. We shouldn't allow a few corporations to mop everything up. Now, if that were the case, if we could have a distributed economy producing these fats and proteins from microbes in a, in a really, in, in, uh, with a very low environmental impact, we could also have a far more just food economy than we have at the moment, uh, because you can produce them anywhere, particularly places, because you want to do this in the greenest possible way, and they rely on electricity, places with a lot of ambient energy striking the ground, a lot of potential solar power, um, which includes many of the poorest nations on earth, 
could be producing their own fat and protein without having to go through the global food chain. Um, local businesses could, 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 could be turning it out um, with specifically for the needs of local markets. And paradoxically, because a lot of uh, uh, food sovereignty campaigners really hate this idea, it could actually deliver food sovereignty and food justice and food security far more effectively than the current um, uh, forms of global food production do. I mean, it all sounds very good, but I mean, already uh, a lot of the money that's going into looking at um, food proteins or, or lab grown meat is coming from Bill Gates and, and many of these other uh, very wealthy men who are already in control mm -hmm. of lots of parts of, of, of the system. So is it really realistic that we can kind of create a, a new industry and that it's a distributed economy? Mm -hmm. Well, is any political change we want to see realistic? And of course, you know, there's always a question mark hanging over that because of the power of, 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 of legacy industries, um, the power of money, which all too often, unfortunately, trumps democratic power. Uh, but we, we have to fight, we have to strive, we have to um, try to ensure that we have a juster world. And that means always taking on these powerful corporate and oligarchic interests. Um, it's never easy. Um, the, the fight is kind of stacked against us because they have more money and that translates into more power. Um, and they can buy political power with their economic power through funding political parties and all the rest of it. We, we know all too much about that, but, um, um, we, we, here we are on the threshold of an entirely new food system, and we have much greater potential to get that right than we do in changing the old entrenched system, which is completely dominated by legacy interests, um, by definition. Um, so, um, uh, you know, if we were to give the, if we were to give up before the technology has even got off the ground, then we are squandering a great gift, um, uh, the gift of having just the right technology come along just as we need it most. Because if we do get this right, and we do um, transfer our means of producing um, much of our food, fat and protein, away from not, not just animal agriculture, but also from soya, from palm oil, from many other damaging um, um, forms of food production, then we could stand a much greater chance of preventing both climate and, and ecological breakdown than, than we stand at the moment. We, we're talking about the possibility of releasing three quarters of the world's farmland from agriculture and returning it to nature, bringing back the forest, bringing back all the rich habitats which we've destroyed. And in doing so, you can not only stall the sixth great extinction, but you can also draw down vast amounts of carbon dioxide uh, that we've already released into the atmosphere. And, and I, I think that in combination, this, this gives us possibly the best chance we have of avoiding environmental catastrophe this century. And we know that doing anything to the farm lobby, farm industry farming is extremely difficult. Um, so on the one side, there's what you've just said in terms of the needing to set up a new industry, but there's also dealing with the, the industry that's there because this new industry could arise, but it essentially just becomes a parallel industry to the, to the agriculture we already have. Um, I mean, we've seen in the EU with the common agricultural policy that um, even with attempts to change it, it, it's not really changed. Do you think it's realistic, given the cultural hold um, that agriculture has, that, that this can be done? Um, and then the second part of that is also, you know, in the U UK, and, and you said yourself that, you know, the UK coming out of the EU, one of the good things was that we could have new environmental legislation, new farming legislation, but the UK government is being very slow on coming forward with any real alternative to the common yes. agricultural policy. So, yeah. so, you know, culturally, can we change it and then be in the UK? You know, is there a real will to, to actually go against this strong mm. lobby? So you're absolutely right to emphasise the cultural power, because I think um, very often um, people like myself on the left, we, we tend to be very conscious of economic and political power and to underestimate cultural power. And in, in some cases, I think cultural power can be stronger than political or economic power. And the cultural power of the farming industry and for that matter, the fishing industry is I think greater than the economic power of almost any other industry. 
um, it stops politicians from moving against them. You know, all those bucolic images uh, that we are brought up with as children that we see every Sunday night on the BBC, those are tremendously powerful political instruments. And farmers can mobilize them to say, you know, you're destroying the, the, the character of the nation, you're destroying our way of life. Um, these things which I think in some cases count for a lot more than the raw power of money. Um, but we do have to question that and, and challenge it and confront it because it's those, uh, that, that those cultural powers, for those sources of cultural power, which make it very, very hard to ensure we have the, the environmental transition, which we're going to require if we're going to sustain our life support systems. Um, and, and in principle, we have a, a very effective means of doing this because you know, we don't need to tax meat. We don't need to um, impose any new regulations. We just need to stop subsidizing it. There would be almost no um, meat production on earth if it weren't for subsidies in one, one form or another uh, in, in current market conditions. That, that's what makes it viable. And we're paying for arguably the most destructive industry on earth. And that's particularly the case with grazing um, because grazing is just not economic. Um, and so huge amounts of money are spent. Um, more than 50% of all subsidies in the EU and EU subsidies account for over 40% of the entire European budget. It's just amazing, farm subsidies. Um, and most of those are going to, 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 to livestock and that keeps this tremendously destructive industry going. So now what I want to happen is not for farmers to be shut down, driven off the land, all these things we're told that people like me want. I don't want that at all. I want... I want the money to be repurposed and farmers paid to restore the land. Um, and, and that means doing something completely different, but farmers are really good at doing things that are completely different. I mean, I'm constantly told by farmers, this is what we've always done, we can't change. And then the next day you see that they just signed a contract with Cargill to build an enormous chicken factory on their sheep farm. And you say, hang on a moment, I thought you said you couldn't change. Farmers are highly resourceful and resilient and will follow the economic incentives. So whatever their cultural power, you know, they will, when they see that the money isn't right or the, there's, there's a, a different way of making money, they will change and build a new culture around that change. That's what we've seen happening again and again. And practices which we're told are thousands of years old aren't thousands of years old at all. Um, they turn out to be entirely contingent on, on current economic conditions. Um, and so change those conditions and farmers will change and farmers will be happy to change if the money is right. That, that's, that's the sort of story we get repeatedly from, from history. But people are so afraid, politicians in particular, of that cultural power that, that, that they won't move. So, so the promise was, you know, we can have a much better system than the common agricultural policy. And that would not be difficult because it would actually be really hard to come up with a worse system. I mean, the common agricultural policy, um, it insists that um, wildlife habitat is destroyed. If, if you want to receive your basic payment, you have the land has to be in what's called agricultural condition, which means it doesn't have so-called permanent ineligible features on it, which you and I know as, as wildlife habitat. And I've seen, for instance, in Transylvania, it's, it's just heartbreaking to see this happen. These stunning wood pastures, these unbelievably beautiful and rich wildlife habitats full of birds and, and, and mammals, uh, reptiles, insects of, of all species being ripped down purely in order to harvest European subsidies. Because if that land has those ineligible features on it, you can't claim subsidies on it. So there's this huge perverse incentive for destruction built into the European subsidy system. And it's probably destroyed hundreds of thousands of hectares of prime wildlife habitat. It's one of the most destructive forces on earth. So anything the U UK does couldn't possibly be worse than that. However, they'll, 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 they'll make their best effort at ensuring it's a really crap solution. Um, and what we're seeing is all the sort of bold statements that the conservatives made gradually getting watered down getting the marrow sucked out of them and but most importantly of all we'll be monitoring an enforcement which is just non-existent effectively here i mean already we see a complete crisis in monitoring and enforcement 
with the in the rural uh, the rural payments agency environment agency natural england their equivalents in in the other three three nations of the uk um in total meltdown because their budgets have been cut so badly they can't afford to put people in the field they can't afford to do uh, inspections more than every few hundred years per farm i mean it's it's just a farce and so whatever the rules say on paper if there's no monitoring and enforcement those rules are a dead letter and farmers, it'll sort of be pretty well the same system as now. Um, farmers will fill in a form saying, I'm doing this, give me the money, and they'll be sent the money. I wanted to change text slightly and ask you about worms because and, and bees, basically, because um, everybody or lots of people now are in favour of protecting the bees. We have massive protests anytime a, a pesticide is approved that they might harm bees. But you, you mentioned very clearly in your book that worms were basically harming worms the whole time. And worms, rather than bees, are perhaps the basis of our food oh, um, yeah. production system. Um, and you also say, you quote, um, you, you, you repeat a quote whereby you say that bringing bees into, the, bringing bees is like bringing a city into the countryside. Yeah. And I wonder if you could explain a bit more about bees and, and are they good? Are they bad? And, yeah. and why don't we, you know, support the humble, humble worm a bit more? Why don't we know more about <laughs> him and what he's doing for, for our yeah. food system? Um, they, they, worms are hermaphrodite. I just, <laughs> right, <okay. laughs> we could get into serious trouble otherwise. Um, so, um, so on bees, first of all, um, let, let's um, distinguish domestic honeybees, so which are a, a form of livestock, from from wild bees. Um, and unfortunately, that distinction is far too little made. Um, very often, you know, when people are talking about bees and the need to protect them, they're thinking of honeybees, or often the article has a picture of honeybees associated with it. Um, um, uh, honeybees you know, are, are very similar to other forms of livestock that they have massive impacts on an ecosystem when you bring in a hive as as my um yes as professor pat wilmer my old um um, um uh, uh, entomology uh, lecturer said it's like bringing a city into the countryside um suddenly you've got many many thousands of these quite large aggressive insects pushing the other pollinators off the flowers coming to dominate the ecosystem and actually often doing a much worse job of pollination than 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 the local wild bees are because um there's a huge variety of wild bees and indeed of other wild pollinators, um, hoverflies, um, beetles, moths, um, which are highly specialised for particular flowers. And, and they will do a much better job as specialists in pollinating those flowers than the generalist honeybee will do. And, and our fetishization of honeybees is a bit like our fetishization of, of cows and sheep. Um, it's actually uh, you know, what we're celebrating is something which is ecologically destructive. Um, a, a land of milk and honey is an ecological disaster zone. Um, so does that mean so, we should stop eating our organic honey as well? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to scoff at people who gave up honey because I thought that's just ridiculous. That's taking veganism to, to a ridiculous point. But and now come to see um, that they have a point. <laughs> and that actually, yeah, honey is not great. It really is a damaging product. And you know, people hate to hear this stuff. And I totally understand why. Um, but yeah, we, we have to follow the facts. We have to sort of be guided by the science, not by what we want to believe is true. Now, as for the humble earthworm, yes, very much so. The, the, the thing about the earthworm is it's not the sort of be all and end all in terms of soil ecology, like the, the magic creature, but it's, it's the thing we can see and count easily. And so it becomes a good proxy for the health of, of the soil. I mean, the worm, earthworms are, are very beneficial for soil anyway, but they're one a part of a massive ecosystem of tremendous complexity under the ground, most of which you can't easily see. Um, because it, it's 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 too small to be seen with the naked eye. Now, you know, you take a forty times lens to the soil, and it just bursts into life. It's absolutely stuffed with, I mean, hundreds of thousands of animals under every square meter of ground. It's quite amazing. But most of them are tiny little things like springtails and mites and diplurans and symphylids and all sorts of things which most people have never heard of. And they're difficult to count, difficult to measure. Even more important in soil ecology are bacteria and fungi, 
And those are generally at the microscopic level, particularly the bacteria, so it makes it harder still and, and their numbers fluctuate enormously. So earthworms end up being a good proxy for the state of, of the soil. I and mean, if you've got loads of earthworms of lots of different species, you can by and large say that is a healthy soil. Okay, so you, we, we need to give up eating meat, we need to stop dairy, we need to give up our honey, and even in terms of the humble vegetable, you're very clear that most even vegetable crops or, or um, uh, corn or wheat crops, we need to change the way that we're, we're farming per se, basically change everything. Mm. Um, and one thing that comes across in your book with the, the people that you meet and, and who you interview is that, and who are trying out different systems that, uh, that hopefully are greener, is they work very, very hard. I mean, I think farmers in general work hard, but these people really, really do work hard and make it very clear, um, your, your, the Tolly, who you interview, who's a, a farmer, that I think he says it, it's, not a, it's not a job, it's a way of life, basically. It's a, it's a, it encompasses you totally and takes over your life. Um, and yet we're, we're living in times where people want more free time. We're talking about a four-day week. We're talking about your job being very much something you leave in the office if you still go to the office. How does this idea of, of changing the way we farm totally and it being harder work than, than what we have now fit with, with modern society and, and the way that society is moving? Um, uh, the farmers I interviewed are, I mean, they work crazy hours, really crazy hours. It has to be said they love it. Um, you know, that, that um, at least a couple said I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, however insane those hours are, and they love the land, they love being outdoors on the land. Um, and often their pay is appalling. They receive almost no money at all. Um, I, I don't know how sustainable it is to roll that model out. And in the case of um, Tolly, Ian Tolhurst, this remarkable horticulturalist grower of fruit and vegetables, who's, who's really revolutionized his field and, and introduced techniques which are now being widely um, copied by people. The fundamental problem is that while his techniques might be replicable, he's not. And, and you need someone who's very driven and, and very committed to, to, to make this system work. And part of the problem is the money. It simply doesn't pay. It doesn't pay to do it right. And so somehow we, we have to address that. And at the moment, we've got a series of totally perverse subsidy systems around the world. We're spending between 500 and $600 billion a year in farm subsidies worldwide. And you know, to put that into perspective, the world has totally failed the rich nations to meet their pledge um, to spend $100 billion a year on, 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 on climate finance. Um, you know, nowhere near that. And yet here we are spending 500, 600 billion, almost all of it, is perverse. Almost all of it is destructive. There's almost no environmental content in any of it. A lot of the environmental content is actually doing more harm than good uh, because of weird perverse aspects. And, and it's like, we can surely use that money better. And, and one of the ways, yeah, we should be paying farmers to make environmental transitions, but also, you know, let's, let's make the food that's healthiest for us affordable. And, and at the moment, the subsidy system is an incredibly inefficient way of producing affordable food. In some cases, it makes it more expensive, not less so. Um, and, and, and I think the key innovation is, is something which was suggested to me by um, a friend who runs a local food bank. And she said, I don't understand why fruit and vegetables are not subsidized at the point of sale. And it's just so obvious. It's so simple. And, and in some parts of the world, food is subsidized at the point of sale, no, no, seldom fruit and vegetables. But, and, and, and you could use that to ensure that people like Tolly got fair payment for, for their produce, while at the same time, ensuring that you don't price fruit and vegetables out of people's reach. And at the moment, including in the UK, they are priced out of many people's reach and people just can't afford a healthy diet. Uh, food and agriculture organization figures suggest that a healthy diet costs you five times as much as one that's merely adequate in terms of calories. And that's ridiculous. It shouldn't be that way. And we can stop that. We are, we've got tremendous aggregate wealth and we should use some of that to ensure A, that everyone can eat healthily and B, that those who are producing a healthy, low impact diet should be properly rewarded for it. 
And how would you see this actually taking place at a global level? Because we can say legislate at an EU level or a UK level, but then globally, and obviously big countries like Brazil are highly responsible for lots of, of production of not just beef, but also various crops. And, and um, Bolsonaro, if he remains, is probably not the person who's going to be convinced <laughs> by this argument. So, you know, does this have to be part of the, the climate negotiations? If you look at the national plans, most people are focused on, most countries are focused on energy system change and not really on land use change. Um, the Biodiversity Convention is very separate and is not really getting off the ground in the same way. So, so what do you see as a solution at, at a global level to move this forward, given as well that, I mean, Antonio Guterres said this week, you know, we've essentially got 36 weeks or whatever to start, you know, reducing emissions. And this is a key yeah. way of doing it. Yeah, I, we need far more international focus on this. We, we need far less of the sort of uh, cowardice, really, that's been evident surrounding this issue. But we also need to um, make it a national issue as well. It, it's, it's sometimes I feel that we use um, the global nature of the problem as a way of, of, of deflecting our own responsibility. And we can say, well, you know, we we would love to act on this, but look at China, look at India, look at Brazil, whoever it might be. What can you possibly do? And you say, well, what you can do is to show you mean it by acting at home and, and creating a model that then can, can be applied. And you know, why should China, India, Brazil, anywhere take us seriously and trust our good intentions if we're not demonstrating them? Yeah. Exactly. OK, but but still, even if it, it starts at home, there has to be surely some global framework, because right. otherwise the what happens is you, you make a certain amount of legislation at home, which changes what's happening on the ground. But then if we look at trade deals, you'd have to change the, the trade deals. And so you could just end yeah. up with the UK getting rid of its farming industry, but importing beef from elsewhere. That's absolutely true. And there's, there's a massive danger with that. And trade deals tend to be very strongly oriented towards corporate interests. There are far too many corporate lobbyists on the inside of trade deal negotiations. Um, the, there's um, this, this sort of uh, very potent issue of um, investor state um, dispute settlement, which basically means offshoring decisions to courts um, um, uh, run effectively by corporate lawyers who tend to um, allow um, corporations to sue governments for any regulations they don't like. Um, all these are really deadly to international efforts, not just on food and agriculture, but on climate or indeed any good thing that we're trying to introduce. And there are fundamental problems with the global architecture, with, with, uh, with, with, with global politics as currently conceived. I mean, there's huge issues with the Bretton Woods settlement, uh, the way power is distributed within the IMF, within um, within the World Bank, there's enormous problems with the way both um, um, the WTO operates and, more importantly nowadays, bilateral trade negotiations operate. We need to democratise them, um, and and we need uh, just far more political attention paid to them. And, and again, you know, the shopping list gets longer and longer. The the, the demands get more and more difficult. But we have to be politically ambitious. And it's all too easy to throw your hands up and say, oh, what can you do? Look how massive these forces we're confronting are. Well, previous generations of political activists have been up against even more powerful forces and have somehow um, managed to, to win. And we, we, we have to take heart from that. And at the end of the, the book, you talk about poetry. I, I, I was trying to find the exact quote, but you suggest that poetry is to blame for a lot of these problems that were this <laughs> idealization of, um, of farming, of agriculture, of how our landscapes, uh, our countryside should look. Um, and obviously, in, in recent years, books have been rewritten or, or even banned because they have racist overtures or, or they're very gender specific. Um, I mean, do you think that we should start, you know, banning the Topsy and Tim books where we sort of got cows and sheep in fields? Do we need to read different things? You know, do we really need to kind of overhaul what, how we what we read so that to change our cultural perception of agriculture? Well, well I'm certainly not in favour of banning those books, but um, I'd love to see far more diversity in children's literature. I mean, it is amazing for very small children. Um, and I noticed this um, very much with my own, that 
roughly half of all the books for really tiny children, for infants, are about farm animals. And, and there's this repeated trope of this, the farmyard being the place of harmony and, and comfort, where you've got your rosy-cheeked farmer and you've got your one pig and your one horse and your one cow and your one duck and your one cat, and they all talk to each other and all a happy family together. And of course, there's no, no indication of why they might be there or what the farmer's plans for them might be, obviously. But apart from anything else, it's just so unoriginal. It's so boring. I got bored out of my box reading those stories to, 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 uh, to my kids. And surely children's authors can do better than this. And, and surely, you know, instead of just repeating these ancient tropes and making the livestock farm, which is in reality a place of horror, into um, this dreamy, bucolic, Id idyllic setting, um, where, where we, which we associate with everything that's right and good, surely we can have something a bit more original and imaginative for very small children than that. It's true though, but we all become indoctrinated because afterwards when we're sitting on a train, we say, oh, look, there's a sheep, there's a cow. And so we play into this narrative yeah. constantly. And I find myself doing it. And when I was reading your book, I was, uh, yeah. <laughs> and of course, if you take your kids- Sorry. If, you take your, if you take your kids to a farm, it's going to be one of those yeah. petting farms where, you know, you get to bottle feed the lamb and you, and you get to hold the little chicks and stuff. And those petting farms are the reification of those, the, 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 those children's books. Um, and of course, we've all been there. We've all done it. But, you know, we get sort of channeled down those tracks by the deep root metaphors that to a very large extent govern our perceptions of the world. On a slightly different issue, um, I mean, the farm lobby is very strong in the sense that, you know, in Brussels, if anything is discussed in terms of the cap, the, the French just tend to drive their tractors into the centre of Brussels and nobody can get anywhere. So they are very powerful. And I noticed that when you were diagnosed with prostate cancer, the Farmers Weekly came out with this very fatuous um, links between what you've discussed. And so, you know, they are strong and they're not afraid of, of getting out there. At the same time as we have them protesting, the UK has just today put, uh, pushed through the, the protest bill. Um, you know, do the sort of people who want change need to get out on the streets much more and not protest just for, for climate action, but for something much more specific in terms of um, farming, changes in terms of farming or, or practices that we accept as normality? We do. I think on a lot of rural issues, we have granted farmers and landowners in general almost a monopoly. Um, when they erect a no trespassing sign in front of their uh, field, both literal and metaphorical, we accept it and say, oh, we can't walk there. We, we, we can't challenge them on these issues because they belong to, to, to the farmers, they belong to the landowners. Well, in England, for example, um, uh, farmers represent just 1.4% of the rural population, 0.3% of the total population. What, why do we say you're the only people who should have a legitimate say? There's loads of people living in the countryside who want things done differently, but they're almost disenfranchised. Um, they, they feel extremely shy about raising their voices and challenging the landowners. And I think we should be bolder. Yeah, I think part of it's to blame with Enie Blyton and how how uh, the, the the dichotomy between the rural children and the, the city children were all traumatized from well, young age. Yeah, no, I mean it, it all feeds. I mean these cultural tropes are very very powerful. It's true, but there's also a sort of you know a really dangerous um, sort of mode of discussion in the countryside, which which demonizes townies and incomers and and sometimes reaches a point of what I would call ethno localism. Um, and and it's it's a, it's a really ugly politics, but it's one we just accept. We scarcely challenge it. Um, and and as a result, we see all sorts of so really quite unpleasant trends in the countryside, which we don't which we'd prefer not not to look at. So for instance, while Black people in um, London are four times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people, which is shocking enough already. In Suffolk, it's 17 times. In Dorset, it's 25 times. And you know, we, don't, we don't think about that. We don't look at it. We just sort of prefer to ignore all that. There's a real problem in the countryside. 
you know, we cast the countryside as being a seat of innocence and purity, but it can be just as cruel and just as corrupt as, as a city, in some cases more so. What do you want people to take away from your book? Because I find already it's it, trying to put these ideas forward in terms of even eating less meat brings you into conflict with your family, with mm. friends, um, mm. and the idea of getting rid of farm animals and, and really having the change that you're talking about is, is extremely controversial. It's almost dismissed by most people you speak to. Um, so how can we now you know, move forward and make this a proper discussion point and not just um, something which is seen as, as kind of, people want to argue against it and it's almost dismissed because it's too wild an idea, people can't get their heads around it. So, mm. so what has to happen now in terms of making this a, a, just a debate almost to start mm. with and, and normalizing the, the idea of not eating meat? Well, I, th I think we should emphasize the positive aspects of it, mm -hmm. that, that we're, we're looking here at perhaps the only opportunity we have seriously to intervene to prevent the collapse of our life support systems you know, of, of stopping the sixth great extinction, of massively curtailing climate breakdown, of greatly curtailing water pollution, the destruction of habitats, of ecosystems. I mean, right across the board, you can change so much by changing our diets and the way that they're produced. And there's loads of positive new technologies, not just in terms of new fat and protein, but in terms of perennial grain crops, for example, um, in, in terms of using soil biology, to regulate fertility as, as this farmer we talked about Tolly does. Um, and, and I think by showing what a wonderful world this could be, a, a, a much richer world in, 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 in ecological terms, a much safer world in, in terms of getting through this century and those that follow, I think you can bring a lot more people with you than just saying, stop doing this and stop doing that. It's, it's that positive environmental vision that's so important. And that's, I do try to emphasize that in my book. And I know we've mostly talked about the difficulties, which is understandable, but you know, there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of things to look forward to if we get this right.